Well, hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, I mean over the top beautiful, soon to be full moonlit night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization up here in Bugs in a Jar Farm. What have we made it to? Good Lord, is it Thursday night already? It is August 11th. I think we're heading down to 52 degrees tonight here. So, uh, anyway, guys, I was going to do my oilprice.com roundup. It's, you know, I've, but I haven't I talked about much here on Collapse Chronicles, is I also get this newsletter every week from the Washington Post uh, called their Energy and Environment roundup. I've never been quite sure of why they lump energy and environment together. That's kind of like lumping, I don't know, logging and environment uh, together or mining and environment together and all the rest of it. But for whatever reason, I think over there in England, don't isn't that isn't the same minister the energy and environment minister. Uh, anyway, we'll have to think about that, but uh, I'm just going to go through this since I've never talked, I don't know why I don't ever bring this up, but the Washington Post and <laughs> guys, uh, <laughs> the Washington Post talking about uh, U.S. federal environment policy, it, 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 you know, is somewhere, it, you know, Sancho Panza reporting on uh, chipmunk policy. But, you know, it's a real mixed bag. I don't know how to play this. They, they have about 20 stories. What they do is they send me every week, you, you know, the stories from their environment desk and unbelievably they haven't paywalled me out. So some of the stuff when it's just straightforward, you know, just talking quote facts uh, about how doomed we are, uh, they do a pretty good job. I, I give them, you know, for the mainstream media when they're just sticking to the 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 news, as it were, it's when they start putting their little editorial raw raw America slant on here. But since I under we're going to uh, center this rant on this story. This is actually not from their environment desk. This is from their foreign policy desk at Washington Post this week. Fearing a major climate setback, U.S. urges care of Congo River Basin. Uh, but since I understand that no one is going to make it to the end, so I'm just going to go down the headlines and we're going to wind up with that one. But this is just uh, their lead-off story. As temperatures rise, industries fight heat safeguards for workers. As climate change fuels hotter summers, industry groups are trying to block states from adopting workplace rules governing heat exposure. I bet they are. Uh, okay, here is climate change's impact intensifies as U.S. prepares to take action. Yes, the Arctic is warming at a much faster rate than many scientists had expected. One of several recent indicators providing evidence of climate change's intensifying impact on the planet. Yes, but the U.S. is preparing to take action, which of course is the big story this week. All right, this is one of their stories. After passage of climate bill, long road awaits. Well, 
unless you're an oil company, the road just got a lot shorter. Uh, <laughs> it is a short road if you're an oil driller. Anybody else, you got a long road. Yes. All right. I, I actually, this is uh, not quite common dreams, but good for Washington Post. He, 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 you know, uh, I'm not going to center on this story because I went over this last night. I'm actually somewhat surprised. Good for them. A victory at whose expense? Climate activists grapple with political compromise. The climate movement is on the brink of its biggest legislative success, but tensions within the movement have also emerged as activists grapple with the challenge of figuring out what comes next. Well, what comes next is uh, more expedited oil drilling is what comes. Anyway, I think we've been over that. Uh, here is what the new electric vehicle credits mean for you. Yes, I, let me tell you how much I give a damn what the new electric vehicle credits mean to me. I was going to run with this one. I love it when they ask a question. Is sustainable mining possible? <laughs> there you go. We actually have the word sustainable right next to the word mining in the Washington Post. Uh, the transition to electric cars relies on the auto industry being able to sustainably source huge volumes of metals. Can it be done in America? I think we all know the answer to the question, is sustainable mining possible? The answer to the question is there is no such thing as sustainable mining. Okay, any more than there's such a thing as sustainable palm oil. Sustainable and mining is called a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron. Uh, even asking the question, uh, I don't want to insult my intelligence or yours by inflicting that story. Alright, Biden finally has a climate bill. What happens next? Well, we talked about that last night, what happens next. I don't need to repeat myself. Alright, this July, you know, when we just finished, featured the hottest nights in U.S. history. A trend toward warmer nights is one of the leading indicators of human-caused climate change. I was just talking about this very subject with my buddy right before I sat down here. But it is not a hot night tonight in New York, baby. What is driving the massive, destructive rainfalls around the country? I wish someone would drive some of that rainfall up to New York. I think we had enough rain. We, we had an, enough rain last summer. I guess that was supposed to cover this summer, too. The infrastructure we have is really built for a climate we are not living in anymore. All right. Here is how extreme the D.C. area rainstorm was Wednesday night. Last night, did you realize that around three inches of rain fell in one hour in some locations? Again, send some of that this way. I was just reading the same story about uh, around San Francisco. And here we are on the East Coast. Salt in water sources become wor becoming worrisome in D.C. region amid rampant growth. The nation's capital and other metropolitan areas, you know, including San Francisco, 
face fresh water salinization syndrome that may become irreversible. Yes. Uh, what's going over there on in Greece? Greek air conditioning limits test countries resolve to support Ukraine. Greece is asking its workers to use less air conditioning and, and turn down the lights in a bid to use less Russian natural gas. But cuts are hard, aren't they? Okay, and all of that. What else is going on in Europe? Extreme drought is gripping Europe, intensifying heat and fueling fires. Many locations have seen their driest summer on record as rivers dwindle to a trickle. Then we're going to go over to Iraq. Iraq broils in dangerous 120 plus degree heat as power grid shuts down. Extreme heat is paralyzing Iraq forcing power shutdowns as authorities extend public holidays to protect employees from 125 degree temperatures. Now we're going to go down to Antarctica. Several versions of this on the mainstream media today. Antarctica's sleeping giant risks melting threatened spike in sea levels. The East Antarctic ice sheet could add up to 16 feet to sea level levels if it, in the long term, meaning by 2500 according to this latest, if Parrot, Parrot, yes, <laughs> if Paris Climate Accord targets are not met, yes, Okay, we don't need to go there. Good Lord. Uh, here we are in Mexico. Northern Mexico has a historic water shortage as water demand, you know, for more and more people being born in Mexico, as water demand has grown, researchers say a lack of rain and mismanagement has led to one of the worst droughts in the northern half of the country. Anyway, uh, good God, uh, this goes on and on. How about stress of climate change is aging lizards before they're even born? Uh... Okay, guys, then I guess this just never ends. Uh, and if you like this newsletter, we think you will like our coronavirus updates newsletter for news to help you stay safe and informed during the corona panic. Anyway, guys, uh, good for the Washington Post. So, uh, but with all of those to choose from, <laughs> I could not resist. Uh, I mean, I passed over, is mining sustainable to get to this one? Fearing a major climate setback, U.S. urges care of Congo River Basin. Yes. Uh, <laughs> This is coming out of Kinshasa from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Not to be confused with the, I guess, the undemocratic Republic of the Congo next door. All right. Here we go. This is, uh, <laughs> oh boy. The United States will work with local leaders in the Congo River Basin to ensure that planned fossil fuel extraction will not 
result in a climate catastrophe, U.S. officials said this week, echoing environmentalists who fear the project will undermine efforts to combat global warming. Guys, the story, this story has nothing to do with global warming. It is about the, uh, the destruction of the second biggest rainforest on the planet. You know, while the Amazon gets all of the press, the second biggest rainforest, the Congo rainforest, in, in some ways is more doomed than the Amazon. It's every bit is doomed. And the Washington Post, in this hilarious, unadulterated horseshit story, acting like the United States is, is uh, concerned about fossil fuel extraction in the Congo rainforest. Uh, it doesn't talk about just the obliteration of the Congo rainforest off the face of the planet. If, if it had nothing to do with climate change, the story here is about the obliteration off the face of this planet of the second biggest rainforest on the planet. Okay, uh, but you would never know that uh, from this. Okay, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital was aimed partly at advocating protection of a vast rainforest and carbon-rich peatland as the country moves to auction nearly 30 oil and gas blocks. The brief stop, I bet, uh, I bet it was a brief stop, coincided with Blinken's tour of three African nations an itinerary intended to promote partnerships with the United States as Russia and China make inroads on the continent. What this is, guys, is a resource war between the U.S., Russia, and China, which China is, is, is the overwhelming winner in the resource war uh, going on in Africa. Okay, uh, this is, has nothing to do with the with whatever this story uh, claims to be about. This is a story about resource wars in the 21st century. Anybody not understanding what a resource war is. This is ground central, ground zero of a, the single biggest resource. Well, maybe the Arctic. Uh, I would say the Congo rainforest is right up there with the Arctic for the single biggest resource war going on on the planet. Although you will never see the words resource war mentioned anywhere in here. Environmentalists, which do not include anybody from the U.S. government, environmentalists are particularly worried about the potential destruction of the flooded forest, an area larger than England where the mud measures up to 30 feet deep. They have warned that disturbing this ecosystem could set off a carbon bomb. And we actually have the words carbon bomb uh, in the Washington Post, representing up to three years worth of global carbon dioxide output. So, uh, you know, Manga Bay, I'll probably have their spin on this tomorrow. That drilling for oil in this peat bog, basically, a potentially will release as much carbon into the air as the entire planet. The entire planet uh, releases in three years. 
This is the definition of a carbon bomb. Uh, one of just the knock-on effects of a resource war. I love this one. While the Biden administration remains concerned about the ability of Congolese officials to oversee the auction and ensure it does not lead to significant environmental damage. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that uh, the Biden administration could be a little bit concerned about the ability of American officials to oversee the auction of oil in this country that the new uh, climate bill just okayed. I love it. Uh, the, the Joe Biden administration uh, talking, uh, yeah, yeah, police. Anyway, uh, U.S. officials say they are not, they are not pressing the government of President Felix Shisegeti to forego the initiative entirely. <coughs> Gee, why would the United States... Why would the U.S. Secretary of State be over in the middle of a peat bog in, uh, in the second biggest rainforest on the planet and uh, not suggesting they don't forego the initiative. Uh, man, this is a real brain teaser. Why the why Joe Biden's Secretary of State would not be pressing the government of the Congo to forego the initiative entirely. One of the world's five poorest countries, the DRC is in dire need of jobs and income as its economy rebounds from the Corona panic. I won't go off into that. All right. This is uh, our esteemed Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, quote, we appreciate the short-term economic challenges confronting the Congo. By conserving irreplaceable forests and other ecosystems, and, all right, and by undertaking development projects only after carrying out rigorous environmental impact assessments, the DRC, the DRC can act on behalf of all the world's people to protect our shared home. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo carrying out rigorous environmental impact assessments to conserve their irreplaceable forest and other ecosystems while at the same time undertaking development projects. Yes. Together with the DRC's neighbor, you know, the the plain old Republic of the Congo, which I guess is the dictator uh, Republic of the Congo, the area represents the world's largest tropical peatland and the surrounding tropical rainforest is the world's second largest after the Amazon. Many industrialized nations already drained their peatlands. Hmm to make way for agriculture long ago, and now we're asking other countries to forego doing the same. 
Yes, as alarm grows, as alarm grows about the potential impact of steps to disturb or drain the peatlands, state and private donors pledged at last year's COP26 to provide at least one and a half billion dollars towards protecting the Congo Basin forest and peatlands. Advocates say much more is needed. Let's just throw more money at it. Okay, so uh, now let's hear from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We've heard for our own esteemed Mr. Blinken. So now this is DRC's Foreign Minister Christopher Lutendula said his government would work to protect biodiversity and the climate. Yes, but, but, huh, he must also address the needs of the people, <coughs> most of whom live on less than two dollars a day. Quote, this is quoting this dude from uh, the Congo, Today, the DRC finds paradox. The DRC is in a paradox that the DRC is rich, is a wealthy country, but with a very poor population. Yes, uh, well, not counting, you know, all of the government bureaucrats on the, on the take from China. So the challenge, okay, this is, this is Mr. Lutundula's challenge. Mr. Lutundula has a challenge. The challenge is to find an equilibrium, a balance between the well-being of the Congolese, Congolese people and every other earthling that humans in the Congo share the planet with. Obviously, I was joking. Okay, this guy doesn't give a flying, you know what, about any other earthling uh, that the Congolese people share the planet with. Zero interest. Anyway, the challenge is to find an equilibrium a balance between the well-being of Congolese people and also the necessity to guarantee a development framework and an ecological framework. I would say Mr. Lutendula has his work cut out for him. <clears throat> The DRC's long history of corruption has stymied other conservations in the past and raised additional concerns about the plan to auction off new energy blocks. Last year, the Sh Shikadetti government lifted a long-standing moratorium on new logging licenses, a move decried by environmentalists. Yes. Blinken said, okay, Blinken said that the United States understands that the Congolese people were wary of involvement by foreign nations or companies. Quote, too often African nations have been treated as instruments of other nations' progress. Wow! Ha! Huh. As a resource war cranks up as the single biggest resource war in the history of Africa, as with the opening salvo, we hear too often African nations have been treated as instruments of other nations' progress rather than as authors of their own progress. Resource, resources have been exploited for other countries' gains. That 
is not what the United States will do. Yes, we do not want a one-sided transactional relationship. Instead, we want to work with you on shared prioritize in pursuit of shared goals. Close quote. Yes. Wow. Resources have been exploited for other countries' gains, but that is not what the United States will do. No, that's what China and Russia will do. And, and everybody else will do. It's actually, I hear, it's the, it's the French oil company is the big player here. It's France. It's not even uh, Russia or China. Blinken spoke a day after he unveiled the Biden administration's new strategy for Africa, a blueprint governed by a desire to develop partnerships with African nations that modernize the historic donor-recipient dynamic. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and jointly develop means to address challenges like climate change. The strategy comes as China deepens its economic influence on the continent and Russia sends arms and mercenaries like, like the U.S. is not sending arms and mercenaries to Africa. Have you ever heard of the AFRICOM? There is, how many U.S. soldiers are over there in Africa right now? sending arms to Africa that you're never going to hear mentioned in the Washington Post. Uh, okay. Blinken said the two countries would form a working group on the DRC's planned rainforest exploitation that would seek to achieve a responsible development of fossil fuels. Yes, potentially providing a means for the United States to help the DRC conduct ecological analysis of various options. The working group would not have decision-making power over which firms are selected to extract the oil and gas, officials said, no, I can imagine that's nowhere in it. Blinken said Shisekedi had committed to conducting thorough environmental impact assessments. And it goes on from there. Anyway, guys, uh, <laughs> is there one person on this planet, uh, well, is there one person even listening at this point, of course, but for the one or two people listening to, to this bullshit, does one human being on the planet believe one word of that unadulterated horseshit. One word of it. Uh, the, these goddamn planet eaters uh, over there, they're, these planet eaters, they're pouring in from the U.S., they're pouring in from China, they're pouring in from Russia, they're pouring in from France. Uh, it is, uh, it, the pigs are feeding at the slop trough uh, over there in Africa, and you better believe that, that, that these dudes over there in Africa are grabbing every bit, uh, as much cash as they can, and stuffing it uh, in, in their corrupt pockets. Uh, it, it is an absolute... Uh, it, it, it's just going to be a bloodbath uh, unfolding over there 
and uh, and and the the reporter who wrote this knows goddamn well that every word of this story was bullshit. The editor of the story knew every single word of this unadulterated horseshit. The publisher of the Washington Post fully understands that every single word of this was unadulterated horse shit. They all get it. Uh, it's no secret to anybody. I have no idea why the Washington Post is publishing this unadulterated horse shit that uh, anybody with a second grade education knows damn well what they're reading. It's, it's, it's pure crap. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking to myself and uh, go over to Netflix and see what I see what's on the minds of the other 99.9% .9 of Americans while the Congo rainforest goes up in flames. Jesus. My guys. Yes, little dog. We survived.